Okay, maybe we'll just get started with the uh, introduction here and get get going. So, uh, welcome everybody to the uh, Friday seminar series, and uh, we have a, a hybrid event today. So we have some folks in the room, and and as well as as online. And so our speaker today is uh, Dr. Tip Meikle. He spent the last 16 years investigating geologic carbon storage, carbon capture and storage at CCS uh, for the BEG at the University of Texas. During his time as a senior research scientist with the Gulf Coast Carbon Center, he led applied CCS research focusing on geologic characterization, seismic acquisition and interpretation, monitoring, design, capacity estimation, and pressure evolution for CO2 injections. Beginning in 2009, he initiated and led the DOE and Texas GLO-funded research initiative to identify offshore sequestration potential in the Gulf of Mexico. I imagine he'll, he'll touch on that. Uh, today's title, a model for CCS development in Texas through uh, 2050. Potential value to university lands, GLO, and other landowners. So with that, thanks, Tim. All right, thanks, Brian. Well, it has been... Um... I think three years since I was in the Bureau Seminar. Uh, I think last time I talked about Tomokomai, the Japanese CO2 storage project that I worked on. Um, so a lot has changed over those three years and I'm not gonna talk about um, those kinds of things today. I wanted to talk about sort of more a vision of what CCS might look like going forward uh, toward 2050. Um, so, uh, I've talked about CCS a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot over those 16 years. And so I decided this time I would challenge myself to think about a way to motivate the topic of CCS that had nothing to do with things I had said before. So um, just something different. And uh, so you're not gonna hear about like 1.5 degrees C or the Paris Agreement or IPCC reports. Um, you're not gonna hear about global climate. Um, <laughs> it, I'm not even really gonna talk about this immense federal spending that we have now that's in the bipartisan infrastructure law or the tax credit expansion in the, uh, in uh, uh, what was it, Invest or Inflation Reduction Act. Um, and I'm not even gonna talk about the economics of CCS, the costs of capture, transport and storage. And, and these are all really interesting topics, but, but I've always, I've talked about those a lot. And so I was thinking like, what else, what else, what else? is there about CCS that would be interesting to talk about. So I'm gonna try and motivate this topic simply by considering how CCS can enhance existing energy uh, assets and generate future wealth. So kind of a, a, a different take on this. So we're gonna take a tour of what I call sort of the, the, the rabbit hole of investment. And you'll see what I mean by that in just a little bit. Um, and at about the time we're realizing how like vast and complicated the rabbit hole of investment is, I'm going to pull back and try a segue into more directly into CCS about like who will pay and who will benefit. And that's that's a really short segue into the core of the talk, which is about considering the development of CCS through 2050. Um, and so when I'm thinking about these these costs and benefits in the segue. I'm gonna pare that down to just one part of the benefit. And that benefit's gonna focus on uh, public lands, publicly owned land. And I'm actually gonna talk mostly about the general land office and the permanent school fund, which is something I've worked with for the past 10 or so years. Um, and if there's time, I'm gonna to get to an example of Corpus Christi that we prepared recently for a DOE proposal, and then sort of explain how that probably expands out into the federal waters um, for that vision. So I hope to arrive at sort of this vision of what this could look like. Um, but first, we're gonna we're gonna take a, a little bit of a tour uh, of of this rabbit hole. Um, so I recently turned fifty, um, and yes, that's a milestone many think about. And um, besides, like the obvious things like graying chin and worse eyesight. Um, you know, you start thinking about a lot of things, right? I mean, it's a time to reflect on stuff. And so I'm thinking about family and aging parents and how far fixed incomes are going to go, both on my parents and my in-laws. And, and then I start thinking about my own family and I'm thinking about my children that are now going to college and, you know, what their life's going to be like. And, and so eventually in all of that, um, you, you come around to like retirement, <laughs> <laughs> and and so um, I'm a ways off from retirement, um, but uh, eventually I came to sort of the career, my career, and I realized like I'm about halfway through um, my career. 
at this point. Um, and so I started at the Carbon Center 16 years ago. And in about 15 or more years, I should probably start considering moving out of the topic. So that motivated a whole bunch of big thinking like, oh, wow, what's going to happen in the next 15, 20, 30 years? So that's partly where this comes from. But like back in 2006, when I joined the Carbon Center, Sue had started the Frio injection projects east of Houston, and they were the sort of the first big, transparent, federally funded carbon injection projects for storage alone. We had injected CO2 plenty before that for various reasons, but this was for, for storage. So, you know, that 16 years ago, we were just at the beginning of field tests for injecting CO2. Um, but, you know, at this point, we've got um, about a dozen class six injection well permits in, in region six, including Texas and Louisiana. Um, and, and we've got an offshore lease for CCS and we're expecting more, uh, as soon as next year. And so in those 15 years, we've actually come quite far. So I'm going to call this the mid career progress report, <laughs> uh, on where CCS is now and, and where we're going to probably go in those next 15 years, considering where we've got, we've covered in the last 15 years. Okay, so I mentioned retirement, um, and when I started thinking about retirement, I myself just slid into a rabbit hole. I was like, okay, well, let's just think about some stuff like retirement accounts and all that good stuff. I didn't think about that much before. I was too busy trying to raise kids. Um, so there's insights from that trip, kind of like Alice in Wonderland, that I want to share with you. And if you're if you're, you know, 50 or older, you probably some of this will be obvious. But if you're not, it will probably be new to you. Um, and um, my next bit might not go over real well because most of you are actually out in the interwebs. <laughs> but you'll see my point. Um, how many of us are over 50 or 50 or older? So so, so in our room, just so you know, it's, it's the majority of our audience. Um, and so you can safely assume the rest are, are below 50. Um, and so... I'm assuming that's probably the ratio out in the interwebs too, although there's, you know, maybe it's a bunch of more younger people out there. I don't know. But if you're if you're if you're in that and you're at UT, how many of you are in the teacher retirement system? So that's most of us that are out there. And you could have multiple retirement accounts. And so my comments on this are going to extend well beyond TRS, but um so the first question I asked was, well, what the hell am I invested in <laughs> in TRS? So I ask you, what do you think we're invested in in TRS? Just guess, what's our top holdings in the retirement fund for the University of Texas Teacher Retirement System? Of course, we're gonna we're counting on the stock market, but which stocks in particular are we invested in? What are we really invested in? Healthcare is one, probably. What else? Energy. Energy is a really good guess. What else? Healthcare, energy. Those are basically two of our biggest expenses and costs in, in, in society. But keep going. You're missing a big one. No. Could be insurance. No. Finance, partly. Okay, so this will be educational, I think, because we missed the biggest ones. So we're mostly invested in IT. And we're primarily invested in, a, in an emerging markets index fund. Interesting. So 25% of our portfolio in TRS is mostly in these 10 companies or entities. Tesla's in there. That's interesting. That's replaced GM. That's kind of a signal. Okay, so so here's our primary core bit, and and this is that, and that's that's like four billion dollars of, of 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 value that's that's sunk in that expecting growth. Okay, so so the total value fund is about fifteen billion dollars. Um, Interestingly enough, my one of my early guesses was, oh, I bet we're invested in some energy companies. The first energy company shows up at number 15 on the list, and the next one shows up at number 18. And combined, they're about a percent and a half of our investment. 
And that's about $225 million, which is sort of equivalent to number eight or nine. So we're almost as invested as much in, say, Tesla as we are in ExxonMobil and Chevron. Interesting. Okay. So, so what about everybody else? I mean, is that unique? So I looked at some of the four biggest states and I looked at what we're invested in. Not surprisingly, it's all the same stuff. Nobody's smarter than anybody else in the big investment world. So we're mostly all invested in, in, in tech, <laughs> vastly invested in tech, and only secondarily in others, like Berkshire Hathaway, Pepsi, Verizon, um, others like that Merck, there's your healthcare, J&J's healthcare, uh, and so is, uh, so is um, UNH's healthcare. Um, so all told, that's like $240 billion in these elements of these accounts. Um, and so you're thinking like, okay, well, whatever. So I couldn't find the numbers for Texas. So I looked at California and there's about a, a million and a half people supported by that account. And last year they paid out about $27 billion, mostly in retirement benefits. And they paid out about $10 billion in healthcare benefits. So the fundamentals are that we're invested in IT and these other things to generate this kind of money to pay for these kinds of things, okay? So um, we have even more people in TRS and we even have less money. So it's, you know, makes me a little nervous as a TRS person, but okay. But, but interestingly enough, this one caught my attention. Texas is mostly invested in this fund that is a, is a, a, it's the, um, it's the uh, Emerging Markets Index Fund. Emerging Markets Index Fund. So we really care what this Emerging Market Index Fund is going to do. So I was like, well, what do they hold? What are they holding themselves? So the Emerging Market in Index Fund is invested in Taiwan Semiconductors, the largest semiconductor company in the world, Tencent and Alibaba. These, this is one of the, this is like the Google of China and this is the Amazon of China. So actually our biggest holding is counting on these things succeeding going forward, mostly. What is an emerging market? Hong Kong, India, Taiwan, mainland China, Brazil, Saudi, South Africa. That emerging markets fund is counting on these countries emerging more in their economic power. And then lastly, it's just like, what sectors are they in? Finance, electronic technology, and technology services. So I think we can all see that technology is a very strong through going thread here, both at like, an, you know, a single level, very complex level. So, okay, who else holds VWO? Who are we in with on this game? Can we count on them? The largest shareholders in the VWO, that one fund that we're 5.5% invested in, are these entities. These are our banks and investment firms. So these banks and investment firms are also counting on that emerging markets fund to do incredibly well. So we are in there with these groups in a thing like this with 2000 other people, entities, to make sure that this goes, that this works, right? So we're partnered in some pretty, this is the rabbit hole. You can keep going on this, by the way. You can ask what else Bank of America holds and figure out that it's all interconnected. They all own each other. This is a vast economic system that is meant to, to, to move forward in a way that supports society. Who has the biggest retirement funds on the planet? Because, I mean, ours isn't that great. I mean, it's good, but, you know. Well, these are the biggest retirement funds, pension funds on the planet. A lot of money, $4 trillion out there. You know, numbers get crazy. But, but what's more interesting is who has these funds? Japan, mostly. Then Europe, then North America, and then Africa has a big one. Why? Why Japan? Because they're old. So this gets very interesting in terms of going forward because the rich world is getting older. 
So over here is the percent of people that are over 65 versus under 65. And this is today. And this is like 2050, 2075. So right now in Japan, there are more people over 65 than there are under 65. And that explains why they've got those big funds. And it's, it's things like Toshiba, right? Or whatever. It's their, it's their core companies that they developed for the, in the 80s, right? So what's interesting about this is this is the next tranche. The ones that were on next on the list in the past list is all the European countries and the United States and Canada. And then I would say Africa is not even on this one, but it's down here along with the rest of them because they all have very young populations. The interesting thing is that by 2075, all of these countries are going to be, all of these countries are going to be where Japan is today. So that means we've got to have something in place to support a population that's got more people over 50 than under, uh, over 65 than under 65. Now, there are lots of ways that you can deal with that, right? You can have immigration or whatever. But look at, remember how we spend our money, right? And I wish this list was more paired with that list, but I couldn't find the right numbers. But, but this is basically right. And this is a percentage increase on our spending going forward. Most of it is percentage increases in the pensions. Secondarily, it's in health care, the two big expenses that we all have. Then there's a bunch in defense. And then what I thought was interesting about this graph is that reaching net zero is put on here. It's a little, little wedge in red here. So what I would say is that by 2050, everyone in Europe and North America are going to be what Japan is today. We need a massive fund to support that, and it's got to have long-term growth. And one of the things that I get out of this is attempting net zero isn't going to break our bank. And I'm going to try and make, I'm making the argument that actually CCS enables the bank, it doesn't break the bank. And that's a very, very different way about of thinking about CCS. It has nothing to do with climate. So in this energy transition conversation, I don't think it's about a transition at all. It's about an evolution that we've been going through for hundreds of years. We move from high carbon fuels like wood and dung and peat down to hydrogen through time. That's been the natural evolution, going through coal, oil, methane, lighter hydrocarbons, down to hydrogen. We're moving from dung to rocket fuel. So that's what powers rockets. So it's an evolution. And just like evolution, sometimes evolutionary lines disappear. We don't have dinosaurs anymore. But sometimes they last for very, very long periods of time. Think about the shark. The shark's been around a very, very, very long time. Why? The shark is damn good at what it does. It's very effective. So this is what we're going to have going forward in evolution, not a transition from one thing to another thing. We're always going to have a lot of things. So when any of these Fortune 500 companies, oil majors, or countries pledge that they're going to do something with low carbon, we care deeply. And I say that because there's a bunch of people that are involved at the societal level and how the success of these things go. And I would say failure is not an option here. So CCS is a big tool in how you can address this. And I will tell you that even though I work with these entities, the two largest entity, the two entities that have proposed investing the most in CCS that I have talked to are not in this list. They are in this list. So what these people want to do is really important. And it's really important that this sector help us succeed so that all of that investment that's in these people can survive. So that we can all work off of it later. That was the long bit. The the, the brief set. Oh, we've arrived at Act Two. Act Two of our program is the, the brief segue. So, take away whatever you want from that prior discussion. That was the rabbit hole I went down. There's this whole issue of so who's going to pay for all this, and then there's the whole issue of who's going to benefit from all this. 
and I don't want to get into the details of this, but essentially industry and investors are going to pay for decarbonization. They're going to get supported by government and by the public. The government's going to initiate the spending because it's hard to get over the hump. And that's what we're seeing right now with all of our, our spending. And whatever the difference is that can't be made up will be added to, to utility bills and energy bills, et cetera. And the public will pay. I've done a whole nother analysis of why you cannot tax the public in a consumption tax and pay for CC or pay for decarbonization. It will never work. The public will never pay for, for decarbonization. They can't afford it right now. But they can afford part of it. And this bit pays for the rest right now. So put that aside. Who's going to benefit? The same people. We're all interconnected. Industry investors get to make some money. Government gets some money, and I'll explain this, and the public gets what they want out of it, which is decarbonization and some other things, perhaps, jobs. So we're going to focus on this bit next, the government, public land, lease and royalties, what kind of money is involved here? So my recent interactions on this topic have been with these entities. So I thought about university lands. And Gregor's here and he runs this program, so he can tell you all about that. I have just a few slides on that. I worked a lot with the General Land Office, which is a state. So that's a university, a state. The federal BOM, we've talked to them about this topic of landowner interest. Last week, two weeks ago, I went to two meetings. One was the National Oceanic uh, Industries Association. This is everybody that works offshore. They're very interested in this topic. And then next, I went to the to the meeting of the Texas Land and Mineral Owners Association, the private the private side, private landowners. All of these entities are interested in this question of what is the benefit of this to 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 me, basically. So, university lands. If you don't know about it, Gregor could tell you more about it. It's a bunch of West Texas land. Um, they get 25% royalties on oil and gas, so that's really great. It goes into the permanent university fund or the available university fund. We do minerals. We do surface leases for grazing, solar, wind, everything else. We can put CCS in here, right? That fund made 12% of the university's spending of $3.5 billion last year. So pretty important. I mean, if you took away 12% of our budget, it would be pretty devastating. So we know we need to sustain this for our PUF and, and PAF. There's nine clean energy projects out in these lands and 10,000 producing wells, more or less, right now. So that gives you a sense of where they're headed and where they've been and where they're headed, maybe. It's the second largest in, uh, university endowment in the country behind Harvard. It's a lot of money. So we need to continue to grow it, right? It's big, but we have lots of needs. So Gregor's here. He could tell you all about this emerging, this new program at, at the Bureau um, and how they're going to enhance university lands. In the Carbon Center, we've had Edna Rodriguez working on this a little bit, thinking about CO2 sources, CO2 pipelines, net porosity thickness. So thinking about, well, could we put some carbon in out here? And I will tell you, and you already know, it's a busy place. But Gregor told me that I think it's 5% of university lands are conventional oil production. So it's not going to come from CO2 EOR. Most of the university lands holdings out here are unconventional. So plus, it's kind of noisy. We have a whole program that thinks about that. It's very busy. I'm not, I'm not thinking that there's a huge amount of CCS that we're going to do on the university lands. It's just my initial take. Um, now, Oxy is developing a direct air capture project out here, stripping CO2 out of the atmosphere and injecting it. And I think that's a niche thing that's kind of a low TRL technology, um, but it's a big bet. But I don't think that's the story. I think the story is, is much smaller than that for CCS. So let's pivot to the real, the, what I think is the real, real future here, and that is the Gulf Coast. So this is this, is this image out of a study that Princeton did. Um, it's got all kinds of stuff in there, wind, solar, pipelines, everything. They did CCS too. And they looked at basically around the country and thought about basins and everybody can disagree with these specific numbers, but nobody disagrees with this, that most of our storage out there is gonna come in the Gulf Coast. 
and we can use the Illinois basin and we can use Rocky mountain basins, or we can use, you know, some of these other basins, but we're mostly going to be doing this in the Gulf of Mexico, in the Gulf coast and the Gulf of Mexico. Okay. So that's, that's not me saying that that's other people saying that, but I agree. So my favorite map, because it evolves constantly, and I've added new things for those of you who are bored of me talking about this map. <laughs> Texas has one EPA class permit, six well. Louisiana has six in process. So that didn't have that was that was not true years ago. So well permits are in action. Louisiana is far along in primacy. Texas is coming along. I've always talked about the pipeline that this this is the CO2 pipeline network that Denver owns. And if you saw in the news recently, ExxonMobil is in talks to buy Denbury, which would include this pipeline. Um, the other news that came out recently is this other CO2 pipeline that goes from the Petronova project down to West Ranch. JX Nippon bought 100% of that. So JX is having their own ideas about this particular segment. Um, so we have an offshore lease, offshore Jefferson County. We were pretty instrumental in helping get that going. So it's about 63 square miles, sits right offshore Jefferson County, right here, big piece of it. Um, and there's two more that are under consideration currently in Louisiana, about 16 square miles over here and about 28 square miles offshore, um, the ship channel coming out of uh, um, Lake Charles. So these are, pub this is all public. So I put numbers on here for projects. We've got like a dozen more projects now that are announced and going forward in various ways. Um, and so I would say that this map didn't look anything like this before. Remember in 2006, all we had was this plus sign, which is the Frio project. So that's how far we've come in 15 years. So pretty, pretty impressive, I think, actually, given all of the challenges that this topic has. You picked a good location, Sue. It's actually quite relevant. <laughs> Okay, interestingly enough, I'm a, I'm a numbers guy at heart, and so I keep track of who's, who's leased what and how much, you know, do they think they can put CO2 in it. So this is the lease area that's been announced on some of those prior projects, and this is the amount of CO2 they think they can stuff in it. And so these are just envelopes of 4 million tons a square mile to 2 million tons a square mile. So basically, we're talking about projects being announcing in sort of the 3 million tons a square mile range which is spot on because the 71 square miles offshore Port Arthur has a capacity of somewhere around, um, I think it's actually higher than this, it's 225 million tons or something. So that's kind of, those are numbers that are hard to come by, by the way, you have to keep track of them as they go by. The other thing that goes by really quickly, but you can keep track of is how much people are paying for what. So these are some announced sales, lease sales, and these are the amount of money that were paid on these leases. And so this is the very large offshore federal lease that may or may not be for CCS, which is why it's asterisked. But it was about $15 million for a ton of area, and they ended up paying about $27.50 an acre. Whoo, bargain. Because everybody else is paying like, you know, twice or four times as much. So these other projects, even though they're paying, they're paying less, they're, they're actually paying more per acre. So when you think about square miles in here, uh, dollars per square mile, that's another metric there. Um, how much royalty are they getting? Well, this isn't a real project, but these have real numbers. It's about a buck 50 a ton. If you convert that to dollars in MCF, it's about eight cents in MCF. Okay, eight cents in MCF, buck 50 a ton, which is 3% of, $50 a ton, that's where I'm going next. So a single lease example, let's just take the one that we sort of think about in the offshore Southeast Texas. Based on what they, they, they contracted, if you read the contract with the general land office, this is what's gonna go down there, apparently. So the cumulative geo low income is on this side in blue and the, and the uh, Cumulative CO2 injection is over here. And this is rough, but it's basically right. You can monkey with a few things here, but you can't change the fundamentals. The first thing to notice is that the GLO starts making money before any CO2 goes in the ground. That's 
you know, kind of the way things work in oil and gas too. But you'll see that through time, you know, they might be making $400 million off of this project. And we might be putting 120 million tons in the ground by like 2050 in that one project. Since they claim the capacity is 225, you know, maybe that's even possible. I just made up the injection schedule here. Could be much bigger. What's interesting to me is that these numbers, hundreds of millions of dollars, there's a gas field out there that we know very well that produced 468 BCF of gas. If you say a, a, an average of three bucks a MCF through time, which is even a bit high for many people, but you know, use three, at 20% royalty, the GLO made about $281 million off of that gas field development. And that went into the permanent school fund. So we're talking about things that begin to exceed the income from an oil and gas field in within decades, right? Same time frame. So this is a pretty substantial opportunity because that's one project. So let's clean it all up. How much time do I have? Yeah, I'm going, I'm, I'm doing all right. We're gonna clean it all up. <laughs> We're gonna go to the six Texas hubs on the coast. We're gonna look at what we think maybe sort of their emissions are based on EPA, which is fine, but not great uh, way to think about this. And let's just capture 90% of that eventually. So we're going to eventually capture about 120 million tons of CO2 from these six energy hubs. Okay. And, and what's that going to look like? So all I did was say, okay, if we've got to hit 120 million tons of injection per year by 2050, that's this number actually, you have to grow the capture at about nine and a half percent, ten percent. That's not how it will work. It won't be an annual growth. It'll be in jumps, right? Somebody will catch two million tons, then four, then eight, then twelve. But you have to grow it at about a nine and a half percent rate on the capture side, which is pretty aggressive. So that's a big growth rate in capture. And I added in three percent tax credit growth, although that's not entirely true. Uh, the eighty-five dollars now doesn't have a, a pin. Anyway. The upshot, 120 million tons a year injected, generating $10 billion of tax credit annually for those entities that are injecting. And remember that $10 billion for that year, that's not cumulative, that's annual. But remember all of those entities had to pay for capture, transport and storage. So that sounds like a big number, but it's pretty expensive activity. So, you know, is it sensible? So let's go back to the landowner. We know that typically the GLO receives about 20 or 25% royalty from oil and gas produced. That was my number from before. And we know that since 1865, we put in about 16 and a half, 17 billion dollars of money into the permanent school fund from that kind of income. Interestingly enough, last year, the commissioner announced a billion dollars of income, and that was a record. So this is a high number for how much can be earned in that, in that royalty scheme. So thinking about our 120 million tons of injection, capturing 90% of six energy ports in the, in, the, in the state and going forward, if you only had a 3% royalty, you know, you might be getting into the hundreds of millions of dollars of royalty per year. Mm. But if you've got a 10% royalty, you might be making upwards of a billion dollars a year from that activity in that year by 2050. And that's equivalent to what we were making before. So there's a, there's a sense at least that you could grow an industry that could provide a benefit that's comparable to a historical benefit. So I think that's real. So you might expect that as oil and gas revenues continue to decline in those funds, you might generate a new source of income that comes like this. And ideally, it keeps that fund moving along, right? Otherwise, we crash the bus. The kids don't get school books or desks. And that actually is true. In one of my children's classrooms, there weren't enough desks for the kids. Okay, on the royalty topic, let's just take a little bit more of a look at that, like comparative wise, 
we've got an $85 a ton credit right now. 3% of that is about $255 a ton that might go to the landowner. And that's about 12 and a half cents an MCF. Okay. 10% of that would, you know, be quite a bit more, 42 and a half cents per MCF. But again, I think it's useful to compare it to the gas extraction historical part, because in gas, we know the gas price fluctuates. And so if you get a 20% royalty, it matters what year it is and how much is produced. And we know all this. But today we've got 540 gas. So that's like 108 cents per MCF royalty. Historically, if you thought about like a $3 gas, it might be 60 cents an MCF. And now you can see why I converted these to cents per MCF. Because you want to know, how does this compare to this? And the reality is, is right now, at $3 gas, the royalty from gas production still looks a little bit more attractive than this. But you could use, remember 10% of that royalty got you up to a uh, billion dollar incomes in 2050 from this activity. So, you know, it's not, it, it's, it's not comparable now, but if you raise that number slightly, it would look as good as an investment as, as gas or as good as an income stream as gas, which is kind of the argument I'm making, right? The wholesale exchange of extraction to injection. So let's think a little bit about practicalities. 120 wells doing 120 million tons a year. That's 90% of capture from six ports. So let's say we had six tight sites with 20 wells. If you put them at 320 acre spacing, that would be 62 square miles. That's two wells per square mile. That is two wells between Mopac, Metric, 183, and Burn It. So you put one at the commons, and you put one down at the bus station. But remember, that's a square mile and you'd need 62 of them. So we're talking about an area the size of greater urban Austin to accommodate 90% of our emissions. It's not that crazy. So this doesn't even take into account pressure, Sue, remember. <laughs> so, okay, let's say it's 10 times bigger. Why not? It's 620 square miles. So you would need six sites that were 10 by 10 or 100 square miles. That's one well every five square miles. That's a lot more palatable than doing a CCS project like that. So that would be like one well per most of you know, central Austin. So that could look like this. These are 100 square mile state land squares. There's six of them. One well every five square miles, 120 wells, six spots, six hubs. Totally feasible, in my opinion. But there's more. <laughs> we know it's feasible because if you take the historical well development for extraction on state lands, which are these blue dots, and you say, let's just pretend that's how fast we can drill and inject CO2, the same rate of development that we did for extraction. And that when I did this analysis, I moved it all to starting in 2020 with like a few wells, right? So you could move this over a little, whatever. It doesn't much matter because it's an exponential growth. But our oil and gas development wells, within 10 years, we had 12 wells out there. And within 30 years or 20 years, we had 132 wells out there. And within 30 years, we had 345 wells out there. And they grew like that. And this is all about economics, right? So if you just give them some nominal CO2 injection rates and pretend we're going to do that again, how much CO2 do you get in the ground? Well, by 2030, you might get 73 million tons in the ground. By 2040, 422. And by 2050, you might get a, over a gigaton and a half. Substantial stuff. So I think that history tells us that you could put the right number of wells out here pretty quickly. Remember, we needed 120 wells to do the annual emissions of the six hubs. So we're not talking about needing to get out here to thousands of wells. We're talking about staying back here in the hundreds of wells. But remember, that's an annual injection rate and we're gonna need to move resources. That resource will exhaust at some point 
And just like oil and gas, we will need to move on. It won't be forever. In the meantime, we'll generate a ton of jobs and income and taxable income and a bunch of the income and the benefit to say a government or an individual is gonna come in this part of the equation. And this is Rhodium Group, and this is a study they did, and so I don't have to do it, but I can just relay these numbers to you, that you could have a significant job base growing this industry for time, and you would generate about $60 billion, according to them, of private investment in growth. Okay, well, who cares? Let's rewind. What if Google needs a carbon credit badly? Where are they gonna get it? Us. We're gonna go inject CO2 out here and they're going to, and that's gonna sustain Google because that's what society has, told, has said we need to do. And if that's what they're gonna decide to do, then we better do it. So are we ready? Yes, we're ready. Thanks to Mike D'Angelo and many others, we've mapped the hell out of this. This is Corpus well into West, Louisiana, that's the state waters. I can go anywhere in the state waters and pick an injection site today. In fact, we have. So I wanna focus on a little Corpus example down here. This is for you, Ramon. <laughs> Ramon's from Corpus. So Corpus Christi is the largest energy port in the United States, full stop. Interesting place. Interesting place to think about how energy is gonna evolve in the great state of Texas. So let's think about that. Here's, here's analysis done by the Port of Corpus Christi because they're very interested in this because they see the development of CCS as a competitive advantage for port development through time. And they're not the only ones because they partner with the Port of Rotterdam and Rotterdam's doing the same thing. So is Humber, so is you know Norway. They know that this is where we're going and they put in the work. So they said, okay, some of these emissions are currently viable. Some of them are pending. Some of them are not so great, but they looked at it. And then they said, okay, how much uh, uh, CO2 is, you know, they've got about, Inner Harbor's got about 3 million tons, Outer Harbor's 8 million tons a year, okay? Um, and then they looked at storage resources from NatCarb and we all know the hazards of doing this, but they're like, they got the same conclusion we all get, which is plenty of storage for these scale emissions right now. Let's see what happens. The interesting thing about the Port of Corpus is they have a right of way that extends all the way out to Harbor Island and they have other right of way and, and, uh, and land over in here. And so they can actually facilitate this. They can become a partner and they are now becoming a partner. So you get to Harbor Island where they own some property and you can put a compression station and then you can go offshore. So what does that look like? Well, I told you we'd already thought about this. So this is what we put in for our DOD carbon safe phase two project. And we expect to know back in December as to whether we're gonna get funded to do more of this. But the idea is to use these right of ways to come down and go out to my, I get to name these things, Mustang Prospect. And Ramon, for you, I've got the Padre Prospect. Um, and, and so we've, we've mapped structure out here and we can think about what we might do. And then X marks the spot. That's where the well goes. Remember, we screwed that up last time we applied. Put an X on the map this time. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't good enough just to show the map. So, so, you know, that's pretty realistic, I think. They're applying to the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law, infrastructure bill for pipeline development and other elements of this. So they're not kidding around. This is going to move pretty fast. Okay, what's going to happen after that? Well, we know we've got an existing CO2 pipeline that comes like this and one like that. And right now, all those people applying to the BIL for pipeline money for CO2 are thinking about this and this and that and this. And so we can imagine these emissions going out first into state waters and then eventually out into the pink, which is the federal waters. So we know the feds have until next month to put out their draft regulations on CO2 storage out in the area. The pink data is publicly available. You can go prospect for CO2 storage out here with a, with a workstation. And it, you know, it's not like you have to go collect data. You might wanna collect new data based on what you find, 
But I put some stars out here because what's coming next is, is ships. And I can go put an order in with multiple companies to build me a CO2 ship right now. Norway's got two under construction and, uh, and um, Korea and Japan are building the same ships. So these ships are gonna be wandering around bringing CO2 maybe out to these facilities without a pipeline eventually, something like that. So we don't have to build a pipeline all the way out here necessarily. We could probably just do this. So if I had to guess what's gonna happen in the Gulf Coast for the next 20 years, until about the time I'm stepping off the stage, gas is gonna go out and CO2 is gonna start coming in. And we're gonna get paid on both. Just like Norway, just like UK, just like Australia, just like everybody else. So when you think about who's really in the game right now, it's these guys. Why? Because their markets are asking for something different. We know that because shipments of LNG from the Gulf Coast have been rejected halfway to their port because they weren't green enough. So we know companies on this map, in this space, who want to develop these projects because those clients are saying, bring us the methane for a while, but we want hydrogen after that. Remember the triangle? We want hydrogen. We don't want the carbon, we want the hydrogen. So where's the carbon and the oxygen gonna go? So the hydrogen can go out. And we've got a hydrogen pipeline as well. So that's my vision of where we're going with this. And I think it generates an incredible amount of economic opportunity, slow, consistent growth, which is something we desperately need. We don't need big flashy unicorns crashing through our economic system. We need bricks and mortar. So that's what I had for you. And I'll leave you there. Well, thank you, Tip. Um, that was a really great, interesting talk. Really opened my eyes. I think every every minute I was learning something new. Uh, any questions in the audience here for for Tip? Yeah, yeah Roman. Oh, yeah. you're gonna tell me you like the name Padre, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. By the way, I'm not from Corpus. I'm from Kingsville. Okay. okay? <laughs> We played against Corpus schools all the time, and they beat the heck out of us. But anyway, we're not going to go there. I was just going to ask a minor little question, Tip. Were were uh, some of your your monetary numbers were they inflation adjusted? No, no. I I will tell you, I'm a I'm a hack That's at fine. this. I'm not trying to write an elegant thing. I'm going to leave it to other people. I feel like my role is to explain what it can look like at the very big scale. Everybody else can go in there with their fancy models and do all this and 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 figure out the fine details yeah okay one more question back matters though right oh. it's cheaper to do things now than in the future every time is that better okay a uh, great talk one thought and i'm just curious this could be an open question i totally get the apple microsoft amazon and google need for this right and i totally get the lng export need to export green what in your opinion would restrict Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, and Google to our project? Would it just be cost? Like if we're the cheapest, they'd go there. Do you see alliances being formed? How do you see that sorting out? I think we've got some inroads into the exporters, right? Because yes. we're in that industry. The other guys, right? What do you see? They're really hard to talk to about this topic because they're out of they're out of their element, right? They're an they're IT companies. They're about technologies. They're not about holes in the ground. They're uncomfortable with it, but I've talked to all of them. Amazon Web Services, Microsoft, Google, I've talked to them all. I've tried to show them what this looks like for them to cover their data center's needs. And basically they are ready to invest at incredible amounts, but they have not yet seen what they consider to be the end game for them. And they have their own internal politics as well, right? So I would say they are still on the sidelines, but they are they are definitely looking over the fence and quite interested in how they play in this. I have um, 
when I say that they're interested in investing, we're talking about billions of dollars. They're not kidding around. They're saying, and so you can imagine the other one that's out there is a are the retirement funds. I've talked to huge retirement funds, and they are sitting there looking at this and going, I'm invested in all of this already. And I need it to stick around. And so I'm going to backstop my investment going forward. It's one way to think about it. But the investment, uh, the, the retirement funds are not, they're on the sidelines watching too, very closely. The banks also, we can now sell those credits to any of those entities. We just can't sell them internationally yet. Tip, you, you had a slide in there where you played with the royalties 3% to 10%. Yeah. I mean, I would have thought that there would have gone a lot of thought into this tax credit of $85 per ton. So what did they, what did the government actually, what are the numbers to backing up those eighty uh, fifty eight dollars they must, they must have had some assumptions going into. Yeah. So the, I think the question is where did the $85 come from? How'd we end up there? And the short descriptor of this is it started at 15 in 2009 it moved up to 35 and 50 in the early 2000, you know, mid 2000 to teens, let's say. And then in, in 2018, it went to 50. And in 2022, it went to 85. Why 85? Because most industry groups were communicating to the government that at $85, we will do a specific amount of CCS. So bring it to that level and you, and we will engage on this much make it higher and we'll do more, right? So it's actually, um, that's where that number comes from. Now, if you're taking a million tons a year, $85, that's $85 million a ton per well, and you're getting 10% royalty on that, you're getting eight, eight and a half million dollars on a well as a state entity, that's pretty good. Now there's gonna be lots of people who say, can never work. It's It's all predicated on a, on government spending, but just remember, government spending is a big part of everybody's economy. And so is private development and consumption is 70% of our economy. So if you stimulate consumption, you get income. So it is a shell game, money out, money in. Can we keep everybody riding soft or is it gonna be a bumpy ride? I think we all want a soft ride. Any other questions in the audience? We have a few questions online here, Tip. Okay. I'll just try and read them to you. Um, this one from uh, Carrie King says, today royalties are mostly on lease holding for extracting fossil fuels, but how should we think about royalties for both, one, fossil fuel extra extraction, and two, CO2 storage? Another way of asking is, if lease owners get paid for carbon extraction and carbon storage, should we expect carbon extraction royalties to go down? Why will consumers ultimately pay higher royalties across the entire supply chain? The short answer is, Carrie, you get to work on that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think my answer is that, yes, you. we know what the royalties are for extraction historically. And those have been the uh, amounts that make it economically feasible, so to speak. And so the starting point for the royalty of gas in is the same as gas out. The state values the poor space for extraction the same as they value it for injection. The difference is, and I didn't do this, but that might be interesting to do, at $85 a ton and 20 MCF per ton, that's a pretty pricey commodity. It's a lot more, it's a lot pricier than gas at our five to three to five dollars in MCF. I'll have to do that calculation next. But yeah, we're going to have to, dis landowners will have to decide how to balance their royalty from extraction versus royalty for injection for sure. And maybe a transition. Yeah. Another question here from uh, David Carr. It says, fascinating talk tip. How much of an issue might, uh, might fault seal and induced seismicity be? Yeah. So Dave's done, uh, Dave did some of the early mapping actually for us in some of these areas that I showed. Uh, in the offshore, and you know, you wouldn't be shocked to know that there's a lot of growth faults out here. Most of our hydrocarbon accumulations are trapped on these growth faults, on these faults. So there's like you know, eight, uh, 500 BCF right here, and that's just one example. So 
I think that faults are going to play a role in CCS. In fact, everybody trying to develop these projects are thinking about not just the static, you know, capacity, you know, that a fault implies based on column height and structure, but on the dynamic behavior of the faults, that is you're adding pressure to, is that going to do something that we can't really think of in typical geologic terms like static capacity? Um, so yeah, we will need, and this is the whole field of geomechanics, and I think we're going to see a resurgence in interest in understanding fault slip, pressure, microseismicity, all the rest of it. By the way, we don't expect a lot of microseismicity out here because these are Miocene semi-rocks, not, not brittle Mesozoic rocks. A couple more questions online here. Uh, again, from Kerry King says, you mentioned how university lands or West Texas in general um, would, uh, is small or insignificant player in CCS, but can UL play an outsized role in getting CO2 storage going faster? Or do you think the quote ship has sailed and we can go straight to the Gulf Coast faster than using UL as a starting point? So Kerry, I'm gonna introduce you to Gregor because I only got introduced to him like two or three days ago. I had no idea that we had somebody in house that was working on this. So Kerry, I encourage you to reach out because they may have an outsized role to play in early deployment. Um, uh, my comments were only really preliminary. I don't mean to discount this as an interesting opportunity. We know we need some PUF funds also, and we need those to sustain too. So, you know, let's let's think let's let's think harder about this. But it's just it's more complicated here than other places. I would just say that. Okay, one more here from David Carr. On the chart, you showed many projected jobs for CCUS, but I didn't maybe see any for geoscientists. Where might geologists fit in terms of an employment scale relative to oil and gas in the past? Okay, for that, you're going to go need to listen to the Halibuti lecture that was just given yesterday, uh, or I think it was yesterday, uh, because the answer is lots, lots and lots. Because if you're going to do all this storage, you have to have people to define it, de-risk it, all the rest of it. So yes, there is, a, what percentage of this? I don't know, these are these are people that think about engineering and construction and all the rest of it. We've got a whole another geoscience workforce over here that has to do their thing before this stuff engages. So yeah, it's, a, it's an enormous, but go listen to the Halibuti lecture. Hey, APG, it's, it's online. You, you can listen. It's um, the ex, ex CEO of BP, um, Cindy Yielding. Interesting comments. So, I have a general question for you about, you know, you touched on it in many ways. I think we all have our own ideas about you know, what is ultimately driving the aggressive capture here. Is it economics of, or is it more this the public mandate, as you'd said, these companies are doing it because the public wants it or shareholders want it, want it or is it uh, government? you know, mandating this or, yeah. so how do you see it historically or going forward? What are your thoughts on that? So the, the reasons to do this for any individual entity are diverse. There's no single answer to why somebody wants to do this. I know companies in Corpus who want to do this because of corporate ESG goals or, you know, something else. I know people in Corpus who want to do this because they see 45Q as an economic opportunity. Um, and I've seen entities here like the port who see it as a way to attract growth because they want to put some of the largest ammonia facilities in the world are being planned for in here. And ammonia is in H3. So you need H2 and H2 comes from natural gas. So you wouldn't be surprised to learn that a big gas pipeline was just built from the Permian to right here. I mean, so there are a lot of competing reasons for why entities would want to do this. Some are competitive advantage. We know that there are LNG companies like Freeport LNG in Freeport who are trying to do this because they would like to market a different kind of LNG product to a global LNG market. Now, whether they'll get the price premium they're hoping for is unknown to this point. But we can imagine in today's current climate that the need to export more methane to Europe is pretty clear at this point. We know that's going to have to happen for the next two to five to 10 years. So, so the degree to those companies are making individual decisions that relate to their own 
strategies for how they're going to do this. And if you're not familiar with LNG terminals, methane comes in, maybe still has a few percent non non methane in it, sometimes CO2. Strip it out, vent it. Business as usual. You're already venting low 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 amounts of CO2 just to get your methane to purity, so you can compress it and freeze it, get it in the ship. But to do that, you have to run a turbine. And to power those turbines, you need to power them. So they're all thinking about how to electrify their power turbines now. And now they're thinking about what source am I going to use for my turbines? Since I've already got methane coming to my site, why don't I just burn methane? Okay, so I need a methane power generation facility with zero, and I'd like it to have zero emissions. Anybody know of one of those? Yeah, it exists. It's in Laporte. There's a 50 megawatt demo, zero emission gas-fired power utility. And right now they're trying to put them everywhere they can get a contract, where there's wherever there's extra gas, basically. So yeah, it's uh, there's a huge number of driving forces in this. It's it's complicated. It's not just 45Q. It's not just government incentive. It's not just ESG. It's not just corporate uh, stance. It's not just competitive advantage, but those are five right there. So yeah. Well, I think we've we've reached the uh, the hour here, and thank you, uh, Tip, for a fascinating talk. And let's give uh, Tip one more round. All right. Thank y'all for coming. Yeah, fifty-eight online. Wow. <laughs> <laughs>